have a whole nation mission trip in a couple of weeks. And so I want to encourage you, uh, if you're sitting with us physically present, uh, to give to that trip today. If you're online and you want to help with us, uh, please let us know that as well. And we will send you different ways. Obviously, there are financial ways that you can help online, but there are also many other ways uh, that you can help as well, uh, including prayer. And so uh, we have at our board uh, there, and we're going to move it into our fellowship hall a little bit later, but we have at our board right there, uh, we have sign-ups for you guys. And so you can sign up for the list of, of donated items, things that we need uh, to take. And then also uh, we have prayer sign-ups for prayer warriors. And you're going to see two or three slots by each category or person's name. And so feel free to sign up for as much prayer uh, as you want on that, okay? Because we definitely need to be sure that everybody that's going, all of our missionaries, will be covered in prayer going down there. The community, the pastor, the family, Grandpa Chavez, and, and all that we are going to hang out with, the, the trip, you know, uh, the worship times at night. Uh, the work project itself, so all of that, we just, we just want to be participating together because, look, what's going down there is just an extension of you, amen? And so some of y'all are like, been there, done it, got the T-shirt, or you're not able to go, or, you know, physically it, it, it might be just a stretch for you to go. You're still going, amen? I mean, we need you. We cannot do this. I mean, one cannot work without the other. Those that physically go down there, cannot be powered and fueled by the Holy Spirit and have the right heart and the right energy unless they have a base of support, what I call the furnace burning here, all right, to light them on fire there. So I really want to encourage you guys uh, to do that as well. Also, immediately following today, uh, we have our Navajo Taco Luncheon, right? And so y'all give all the people that have had a hand in that, you know, uh, a hand. Uh, they <laughs> they did a pilot Thursday night, yeah, and it went really well. I had two of them. I wanted three, you know, but no sense in getting all greedy, you know what I'm saying? So uh, it, excellent, excellent, excellent food, and not bad for us, right? And so uh, so thank everybody that's involved in that and that has uh, helped us. So come down and get you a plate. And I think, are we to going we are to going, all right? So you put the right amount in the plate down there, you get a to-go plate, all right? So just kidding. It's donations only, okay, and stuff. So uh, we'll be sure uh, uh, that you get to come down and at least uh, uh, hang out with us. One thing I want to, let me just tell everybody, remind me to bless the food at the benediction, will you? If we don't do that at the benediction, then, you know, uh, y'all go down there and bless yourself. But remind me to bless the food at the benediction today as well. Also, youth tonight, and so uh, uh, our great Stephanie is teaching youth tonight. Woo! That's right. She's coming out of semi-retirement, uh, and Tom and Desi are going to be there as well to help her. Uh, so 6 o'clock to 7.30 p.m., and then we also have the kindness of our King study at the same time, 6 to 7.30 p.m. Parents of youth, it's a great opportunity for you to drop your kids off, eat with us, and go down there in the study while the youth are learning about Jesus as well. So we fed last week 20 people, right, youth included. And so this thing is growing, so come. We're going to have traveling tacos, I think, tonight. Is that right? Traveling tacos tonight. And so you might see a little bit of what we have left over in there uh, served in the coffee bar over here tonight, all right? So, but y'all come. It's a great meal, really good uh, fellowship, and fun dessert tonight as well. And so I uh, hope that you can make that. Uh, also, um, we are done with announcements. Amen to that. Yay, right? I want to I wanna welcome all the visitors and, and uh, you guys, you know, I mean, just Jordan, all of y'all, Thomases, everybody that's here. Horace, good to see you, buddy. You know, and so it warms my heart to see all just these reacquaintances happening uh, for us uh, here. I'm going to miss y'all when y'all go back to Arizona. You know, when are y'all leaving on that? Tomorrow. Okay. We need to talk. All right? I might need you here another week, man. Okay. So, uh uh, so let's just uh, let's let's set our minds and our hearts 
into motion this way uh, this morning. And then let's open our hearts and our minds to receive the motion coming this way into our lives as Wendy prays for us and we prepare our hearts for worship today. Amen. Please stand and join as we say our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, number 397, I Need Thee Every Hour, verses 1, 2, and 3.
Thank you. You may be seated. Please join me in the opening prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all the bodies in these pews this morning. We thank you for this place, and we just ask that you come and be here with us this morning. We just ask that the words that you've given, Elisa, will just go right into our hearts and that we will be able to open our hearts and minds and hear every word we need to from the lyrics of this, these songs and from the words that she speaks this morning. And we just thank you for being here with us, and we thank you that we have this place. In your name we pray. Amen. And now if you'll join me with the St. Matthew Creed. St. Matthew, we are a Christ-centered family of grace where all are wanted. We are committed to becoming who Christ says we are, growing, living, and sharing God's love one relationship at a time. We got a great, great just treat today. As Pam said, Elise is going to be sharing with us today. And so as we, the service progresses and we go into praise right now, just be lifting her up and that God would do something real and true inside of us today that we would never be the same again. Y'all, we have free worship here. If you want to stand, stand. If you want to remain seated, remain seated. Y'all are going to love this song right here from Psalm 34. We have Psalm 34 all over us. I mean, so Wendy picked this song a couple of weeks ago, I think, you introduced me to it. And then our devotional yesterday, and we didn't know that was from the 34th Psalm. And then the scripture today is also from the 34th Psalm. So, hmm, I wonder if God's trying to tell us something about the 34th Psalm. And right? there was a post today from one of my friends yesterday that was on 34A. 34, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, y'all stand and join us in worship if you want or stay seated. Just lift your hearts up to God today. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me, sing it out, from every fear, and those who look on him are radiant, will never be ashamed, will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard me, and saved me from, me from my enemy, the Son of God surrounds his saints, he will deliver him, he will deliver him. Magnify the Lord with me. Come exalt His name together. Oh, glorify the Lord with me. Come exalt His name forever. The Lord is good, oh, blessed is he who hides in him, oh, fear the Lord, oh, all you saints, to give you everything, to give you everything, magnify now, magnify. Yes. 
give the Lord a hand this morning. You know, we're, we're in a world that needs lots of hope today. Amen to that. And I don't know what's going on in your family or your lives or your workplace or just in your people groups, but people are always looking for hope. Sometimes, like me, I didn't look in the right places. So I was let down a lot in life. Anybody been like that before, you know, until I found him, amen? And man, that thing, golly, what he did inside of me, what he offers to us is everlasting. So let's let this be our anthem today. I hope it will. Now hope be my anthem. Lord, when the world has fallen quiet, you stand beside me and give me a song in the night. Jesus, I need you every moment. I need
Yes, Jesus. Remember love, remember mercy, Christ before me, Christ behind me, your loving kindness has never failed me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, remember love, remember mercy. Let's grab a seat. This time in our worship service is for us just to have some time in prayer. And I just want to remind everybody that sometimes we're standing in the gap for somebody else who can't pray on their behalf. Maybe they're, they're depressed or sad or whatever's happening in their world or even physically debilitated where they can't pray. This is a great time for us to do this. But sometimes when we can't pray for ourselves, that's when we just turn it over and we let the Holy Spirit take those words for us. So we'll just start with some uh, quiet time. If you, there, there's a list here of people that you're welcome to pray for. And then I'll lead us in prayer and then we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer at the end. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you and we just lay out our hearts. We lay out our requests. We thank you so much that we know you are here with us this morning. We feel you here with us this morning. We just pray, Lord, for those right here in this sanctuary and for those that we have in our hearts and minds that their burdens will be lifted. We know that you are an amazing strong, powerful God that can do anything. And we ask, especially for this people on this list, that you'll take care of their physical needs. We pray for this neighborhood, the people that we love so dearly across the street and all around us that maybe have financial needs, or spiritual needs. We just lift those up to you. We pray for those. We all have somebody in our heart and mind that we know is struggling with anxiety or depression or addiction, we especially lift them up to you this morning, Lord. 
And we just thank you so much that we are all here together. And we just praise your holy name for being before us and behind us and taking care of us and calling out our names and protecting us. Thank you so much for being our God. And now we just pray together that precious prayer that you taught your disciples and we've learned through generations of time to pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'll ask our ushers to come down now and uh, uh, to take up our offering. You know, we, uh, our, uh, our trip estimate total for what we need to raise and to be equipped to go to uh, Tehachapi is five thousand dollars, right? You know, and so we've we've had that number, in, you know, in front of people for quite a while now. But y you know, for us, and I don't know if uh, you're joining us online and you don't maybe get to see what I see, but you know, we're not a large church. Amen to that. You know, we're a, we're a, we're a small church, but man, we are big in nature of what God's doing inside of our lives. Amen. And we may be tiny, itty-bitty over here, but we are three times the size of that in compassion and love, right? And that's just what God does for us. And so thank you for the way that you give uh, to this ministry and, and also uh, for the kingdom building. Because, look, what's going to happen, and I don't understand the magic of all of it, but when we do there, God does here too. You know what I'm saying? And so people catch on fire and they... They love him, and so what, what happens? God is not bound by space or time, all right? And so uh, he's going to be working in all of us. So, so I love y'all very much, and I want to be sure that you experience the gratitude that God has um, for us in co-partnering with him in building his kingdom here on earth together. So thank you for giving. Lord Jesus, we do ask that you bless this tithe today, God. And may all of the money that's given, Father, all of the gifts that are given, all of the fruits, the first fruits that are given, Lord, here, go to building relationships for you, with you, and in loving on other people, Jesus. We love you. It's in your name we pray, amen and amen. Thank you guys for doing that. I'll ask the, our children to come down for our children's sermon today. And... Uh, uh, Stephanie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unmock myself. Can you open up the Mevo yeah, so that y'all can hear? Thank you, Stephanie. Jordan, what's up, baby? Y'all yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get ready to sing. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. you little children.
feeling hurt. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you're close to this friend, and then something happens, and you're close to that friend. And then so this one year, I just remember, I didn't have any friends. Can you believe that with me? I had no friends one year, you know? And so, and that was very, very sad. But you know who was always my friend? You know who always came up to me? You know who was always there for me? Was Jesus. And he will always, always, always be there for you. So a couple of things that help, right? When you're sad, it helps that we find somebody that has Jesus in them with skin on. And you know who that might be? That might be your mom or your dad. Or it could be one of these great people out here. Or somebody that knows the Lord. And guess what? You can tell them, Jordan, I'm really sad today, man. You know. <laughs> and guess what Jordan's going to do? Jordan's going to love on me and he's going to care on me. You know why? Because we're tight. We're tight bros right there, right? <laughs> And you know what? Another thing that will help is that you always remember that you're not alone. Amen to that church family. Amen. You are never, ever, ever alone when you feel sad. So I want you to remember those two things. Go talk to somebody that loves the Lord 
and can help you. And secondly, remember, you are never, ever alone. And then the last thing, guess what? It's going to change, right? It's going to change. Sometimes we just have to give it a little bit of time. How many of y'all have ever grown a plant? Isn't that cool? And so that plant started out as a little bit of seed. And did you plant that plant? And every day you went and looked and said, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. I must have planted the plant upside down because it's growing that direction. And it's not growing this direction. And then guess what? One day, it grows. And guess what? Just because you might be sad one day, guess what? Give it some time. The Lord is going to take care of you because he loves you very much. Amen to that. So don't give up, right? Don't give up. I'm so proud of each and every one of y'all. Let's take our right hand and let's take our left hand and let's put our hands together and we're going to bow our heads and we're going to close our eyes and we're going to talk to Jesus with our hearts. Dear Lord, thank you that you love me, Father, no matter what. Father, thank you that you are with me no matter what. Father, I can get on a spaceship and go all the way to Mars and you are there. And Lord, I can get into a submarine and go all the way to the deepest, deepest part of the ocean and guess what? You are there. Father, you are with me forever and ever all the time. So help us when we're sad, Lord. Thank you that you love us. And everybody said Amen. Amen. All right, you guys are going to have a great children's church lesson today with Miss Carmen. And so y'all all give them a hand as you guys go. Thank you for that. Y'all give Jordan a hand for assisting me today. Yeah. Jordan, I'm kind of surprised that you keep coming back, man, you know. And so uh, I've got two more songs in mind for you when you come back and visit again, all right? So you're completely awesome in helping out with that. Um, Y'all stand for the reading of God's Word today. And I just want to, uh, this is uh, from uh, Psalms 34, and it's verses 17 and 18. Y'all read this with me. When the righteous cry for help. The Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. May God add his blessing to his words. Y'all can grab a seat right here. Um, I really am excited about uh, Elisa coming and sharing with us today. There's some pictures of her. There you go. Yeah, as you can see, my ministry began with Elisa several years back, and you can see what I have changed her from that picture into this picture, you know. So, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if y'all remember the fall festival, man, but that, that thing was awesome, Elisa. So, and uh, I, uh, Elisa has been a pretty important part in my life. Uh, I, I, my, maybe some of y'all know this, but if you don't, uh, she uh, was my Sunday school teacher from my seventh grade year all the way through my graduating senior year in La Mesa, Texas. And so uh, I will always be uh, indebted to you for sharing what God did in you with me. And now then, what God does in me, I share with other people, Lisa, because of you and Monty. So thank you for being so faithful. So you didn't know, did you? You're like, no, I just, I, I'm just going to I'm just gonna do the kids. So thank you very much for that. Y'all give her a hand, right? That's good. That's good. <laughs> Elisa, come up, and we're gonna we're gonna pray we're gonna pray for you. And so, uh, thank you for sharing. So come on up here, man. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'll get your mic set right here and stuff. I can't say that she's gonna preach because she pushes back on that pretty good. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Y'all pray with me. Lord, I just lift Elisa up to you right now, God, and I thank you so much for her uh, being in my life, God, for as long as she has, Jesus. And, Lord, so may her words be your words, her heart be your heart today, God. Thank you for what she is going to share about today, Lord. We need to hear this, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen.
Okay. It's on. Can you hear me? I'm loud anyway. <laughs> I don't need a microphone. I was just thinking whenever <laughs> Friday when we had lunch, we always meet the Thomases, and I walked out thinking, I don't, I, I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> and Jeannie said, oh, don't worry, it's all in your head. And I thought, oh, my gosh, does she know what's in my head? I, this is going to be weird. And then Randy comes up in a pink shirt, which my grandson, Jordan, we went shopping for school clothes for him, and he picked out some pink, and he said, real men wear pink. So that's he ran up to Randy and saying that, and he said, no, I wore this for you. Let's get it go, going, girl. <laughs> anyway, um, I picked up. Stephanie asked me what the title was, and immediately it came out, Who Am I? And it seems like um, I've had an identity crisis since birth <laughs> because I, I have older sisters that were, like, gone when my brother and I, they were, like, 14 months apart. And then uh, my mother was told she could never become pregnant again. And then there's me, and on top of everything else, I was another girl. And then um, 18 months later, my brother was born, but he was special because he was a boy. You know, guys get that special treatment. But that's okay, I loved him dearly, and my sisters too. So, um, and also, I know that horoscopes probably aren't very Christian. I don't know. I don't really follow them, except that I know that I'm a Gemini, Gemini so I have a lot of personalities. And that has been um, either a blessing or a problem throughout my life. Because, like, we were watching something on TV, and Monty said to me, did, did that happen to you, being a girl? And, you know, like in high school, you know, we all know how girls can be. And I said, oh, no, I had five different sets of friends, and when they started acting jicky like that, I just went to another friend, and then they started acting jicky. And they consisted of my friends and then the football player, the guys, because I was in study hall with them, and a, a, a Hispanic group that I ran with, and just different people. And therefore, I had all of these personalities around me, which blessed me in my life to come. I figured out that all of my life things that have happened to me have been like a pattern even depression and so um i was always uh, a curious person i drove every baptist preacher i've ever known crazy asking questions and if they couldn't answer them then i decided they did not know what they were talking about this was like, okay, if you can't answer me and we can have a discussion, then they probably don't know what they're preaching. And so, not you, Todd, of course. Okay. <laughs> but I also did that to teachers, and I have found that Kyla, my granddaughter, has done the same thing. She told a teacher the other day that just because she didn't answer it exactly like she wanted, that didn't mean her answer wasn't right, and could she give her answer to get her grade back? <laughs> And I thought, okay, that's what in Jordan, same way, you know, but anyway, and I, I decided, you know, all of this has come to, I'm 79, by the way, so I'm really old, and um, that means next year I'm going to be 80, <laughs> but I think I can handle it. I'm glad to be here, but um, I th I've decided that God gave me two gifts. One was curiosity, because I've learned a lot from people just asking them, why, why did you say that? And it, it's amazing how it stuns them sometimes because they don't know why they said it. I don't know why I say things sometimes, but I will answer it because it, it makes me feel better about why I thought that. And another thing, a gift that he's given me is humor, bordering heavily on sarcasm <laughs> a lot of times. But I can make more fun of myself and make a point than you can ever make fun of me because I, I know my strengths and I know my weaknesses. And um, I will tell you my weaknesses before you get a chance to. <laughs> but um, those, those have been gifts for me throughout my life. And um, my parents were, you know, we, I was reared mostly as a kid in the 50s and as a teenager in the 60s and, you know, adults in the 60s. So. I think I led a very charmed life. Nothing ever happened. My, my dad, my daddy was uh, in the oil business, and he had a drilling company, and he told me never, ever, 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 ever date uh, anybody that's in the, you know, 
that goes out in the field with him, but they were so much fun. And I, I figured out later why he said that. But, and mother was a stay-at-home mother, which was very common back in the 50s. And uh, Jenny and Josh and I were talking yesterday about my mother. She was a kind of a matriarch, is that what you said? Matriarch, I mean, she was a very, she, and she cared a great deal what other people thought. And we were uh, Baptist in a small, I say Central Texas, Monty tells me it's South Texas, but then I don't know how to get to church without him bringing me here. But, you know, it's a, but she cared what other people think, thought. And I figured out later on, she came from a very poor, poor family. And my daddy did, and he was more middle class, which was really unusual for that era. But anyway, uh, and she, she did. She cared what other people thought. And my sisters, that I didn't know that well until I was an adult, must have followed her rules. <laughs> I didn't. And I, I tried my best, but I was always like at youth groups asking questions of the preacher, you know, like they said, you shouldn't dance because blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, what if you're sitting next to a person in church and you go to, blah, blah, you know, and, and he couldn't answer. And everybody laughed, but I was serious. I wanted to know the answer to that and why he said it. But anyway, so that's kind of, I just went through life like that. And um, in college age, we won't talk about college age, but anyway, it was the first time I was on my own, so you can just imagine. So that's what I'm going to let you do, imagine. And then marriage. Um, my sister Nancy said, when I told her Monty and I were getting married, because we're, we're still pretty much polar opposite, but we are so much alike in the things that count. And I've also come around to his way of thinking in a lot of things, but not because he told me to, but because I learned that I was wrong for me. But anyway, my own sister said, you won't be married six months if you marry him. And I said, why? And it was because he was too nice for me. <laughs> and so every year that we have an anniversary, <laughs> every year that we have an anniversary, six months later, he uh, reminds Nancy how long we've been married. We've been married for, how long have we been married? 59 years? No. Thousand years, okay. <laughs> Thousand years, okay. So we start our married life. We had many arguments over religion, politics, just life in general because it was just the way I was. We, he moved me to Muleshoe, Texas, and this is when I always escaped depression because I always ran from it because I always, when I felt a funny way, I would just run to one of my sets of friends or something. But when we moved to Muleshoe, it was the first time I had ever, well, I'm just gonna call it the Bible Belt. I mean, I came from a, a Northfield town in Central Texas, and it's real different than Muleshoe, Texas. And I was judged. I was judged because I asked questions. I was judged because Monty was, well, these two little old ladies that were probably my age now came up to me and said, we're praying for your husband. And I just went, oh my gosh, this, I mean, what am I supposed to say? So I said, oh, thank you, everybody needs prayer. And they said, well, it's because of you. And I went, what? <laughs> and I, I said, okay. So I asked Monty, why, what's wrong with me? And, they, and he said, well, you just, you don't mind saying what you think. And I said, well, they ask, so you don't, ask me something unless you want to know what I think. But anyway, um, it took, that really took me down because then I started trying to be somebody I wasn't. So I changed my whole personality because I didn't want anybody to think that even though Monty and I are different, we love each other, we could get through our stuff. And I realized much later that he married me knowing all about me and he loved me anyway. So I needed to, mostly, <laughs> I needed to love myself, but, um, that really took me down because I was trying then to be somebody I was not. And um, it took me a long time to find who, who I was, which includes part of that person that I became then. But um, then I found, you know, everybody finds their peeps <laughs> in each town they live in. And we, Monty always told me that you, when we move to a town, you, you're gonna 
die there. That's your town. Don't make fun of it. Don't talk about it. That's your town. So I finally found my peeps, and I could be myself. And it's not that I thought I was that different, but apparently I was. But anyway, um, and and that's how we we had both of our kids. That, well, we had our kids in Timmit because the doctor was a friend of mine, and we lived in Muleshoe. And um, okay. Oh, I, I don't know. I just went around. I'm not really a people pleaser, but I became one there because I've always been the type of person, if you don't like me, that's fine. Is it all right if I like you? Or if I don't like you, that's fine. You don't have to like everybody. You don't have to agree with everybody. You don't have to be somebody else to be happy. You can be yourself and still be different and that's the way I kind of always was because I'm kind of a free spirit in Muleshoe they call me the earth mama or the hippie mama because I, I and my kids didn't have coloring books until they were probably what five they winged it on paper that I put on the table and because of it I would like to think they're both very creative as adults and um you know, and people thought that was so cruel because I said well those lines are there and if you get out of them they frustrate you I don't like boxes. I don't fit in a box, so why should I put them between lines? You know, it's just it's frustrating. And, um, oops. Okay, and I was placed in many situations where I felt kind of less than. But at, the, at church, I, I, there was a lot of older ladies, like when I was pregnant both times, they'd follow me around because they knew I had to go to Dimmit to have these kids. And, um, a lot of times um, I just did things because I didn't want money to be affected because it was a small town. Like one time, uh, uh, this, the owner of the flower shop brought five roses to my door. And I said, oh, my sister remembers our fifth anniversary. And he said, aren't you married to Monty Dollar? And I said, yeah. And she said, <laughs> she said these are from him. And I said, oh. What has he been up to? And that guy <laughs> looked at me and, just, and he said, okay, and I thanked him. And, you know, I just, he's not a flower person, so of course I'm going to think it's my sister. Oh, gosh. First we had Josh, who uh, he raised me. I don't think I raised him. Most people with first children can probably maybe say that. But uh, And then with Jenny, he helped me raise Jenny. <laughs> No, not really, but it's after uh, I had Jenny that, um, and my, my daddy was really sick and they didn't know if he he was going to live. Uh, he did, but he had a cerebral hemorrhage and he lived for two years after that, but I was so pregnant and I couldn't go, I couldn't go home to be with him. And my doctor was very wise. He said, you can go, but look at yourself and think about your mother. Do you want her to pay attention to your father while, you know, or do you want her following you around thinking she's with a basket or something, you know, thinking. So I thought it out, and I decided, of course, to stay home. And that kind of started it because I was a daddy's girl, and I made my sister, Nancy, promise me never, ever, ever keep anything from me, never. So we made that deal. I make that deal with my kids because for the most part they've always lived away. And after I had Jenny, um, I found myself going into uh, something that I didn't know what it was. I did not know what depression was, but I found myself not being able to get up and get ready and do what I usually do. And there was only one person at that time that noticed it, and it was like Nancy again. Every morning at 10 o'clock, I hated that phone. We didn't have cell phones, but every morning at 10 o'clock, she would call me. And if I didn't answer, she would keep calling until I answered. And she said, you know, do you have your clothes on? Do you have your makeup on? Are the kids dressed? Have you fed them? You know, she knew. I did not know. I just knew that I didn't have what I usually had in life every day because I'm a real, or I, at, at that time, I was just, blah I didn't have any energy I didn't like people I didn't like myself I didn't I mean you know I love my kids I mean I was with them all day I mean you know it's just like but you know it was 
it was a whole new person that I didn't understand. She saw it, so she called me every day at 10 o'clock, and that was something that happened, it kept happening every day. And I got so bad that, um, uh, and I'm a good actress too, I forgot to add that. I can hide anything, and I hid it. And, you know, Monty didn't notice it. He, he was one of those that went to work every day, came home, played with the kids, went to bed, you know. He, and I hid it from him. And by the time he really noticed it, man, I was so gone. That, and my doctor in, in Dimmit, and I have to say, doctors are wonderful, and I hope you have a good one that understands you. Because you're different than me, and I'm different than you in all, all situations that happen. And uh, he, he actually knew me too well. And so I went, um, he left town, he moved to another town. So I started going to a Dimmit in uh, Muleshoe and he was from Muleshoe originally, but man, he was a hippie guy. And so we got along just perfect because he thought like I did, he acted, I mean, we, we just always had fun even in the doctor's office and stuff. But I went to him and I told him that I was, something was wrong with me, that I couldn't do stuff I used to do. I couldn't <laughs> make the bed. I couldn't, you know, I just couldn't do things like I always had. And I, and he said, well, tell me what you don't like. So I, man, I gave him a list of stuff. And then I looked at him and said, I don't think I like you either. And I got up to walk out and he said, sit down. So I sat down and he said, I'm gonna test you for some things that it can be medically. And then we're gonna talk. So he did that and he called me back in his office and he said, uh, you have depression. And I said, what is that? And I said, am I gonna die? <laughs> and he said, no, it's just, you know, for you, a depression comes in many forms. It visits us in many forms and many reasons, but mine was postpartum. And he told me that that's what had happened and it went undetected. And I had let it go and my doctor and Demet didn't recognize it because, like I said, he knew me too well. So, and, and another thing, as I said, I'm a great actress and I can hide any, most things. So, um, they didn't have computers back then, so I went to the library and scour, scoured the library until I could find everything on depression that I could find. And I thought, hmm, I can lick this. A couple of days later, Jill, you're gonna love this. I was thinking of that song, Why Me, Lord, by Chris Christopherson, because she doesn't like Chris Christopherson, and I love Chris Christopherson. I know why he wrote that song. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I went through a whole time of just really being angry, angry with God, because why did he do this to me? But it was a mechanism that actually I came to appreciate that he was still there bugging me, but I didn't know it at the time. And um, anyway, um, by this time, my friends were noticing and telling Monty, and he's, and I mean, it's not that he didn't notice, he didn't know what to do, he's a man. So anyway, <laughs> sorry, you didn't see that. <laughs> And I, I kept, here's my curiosity, why? Why me? Why, why is this happening to me? Why can't I function? And then even some of my really good friends started saying, why are you depressed? Why? You have a great family, you have a husband who cares for you, works, you have two children who are most of the time really good. <laughs> And people who love you, you are very creative, and you are an innovative leader. Because every town we moved to, I decided to revamp the schools. And if they didn't have a PTA, we started to do a PTA, and all of this, all of this stuff. I've just always have done that, and um, I, I couldn't anymore. And then I got more depressed trying to find out why I was depressed. Then, and that's a question that I never ever ask anybody. Why are you depressed? Because you don't know why you're depressed. If I knew why I was depressed, I wouldn't have been depressed. But um, it's, a, it's really a rude question to ask somebody. I'm just gonna say it right there, it's rude. But anyway, um, I don't know, just a minute. I'm, 
I'm also kind of a, I know it's hard to believe that because I'm so chattery, I, um, I don't talk about myself. This is the first time I've ever, well, one time I gave a, a, a talk to our ladies group a long time ago. It's the first time I'd ever done anything. And these two older, probably my age now, came up to me and thanked me because people didn't talk about it after they had children. But I, I don't, this is real kind of hard for me because I don't talk about myself and the deep things that, that bother me or that I'm afraid of, because I am. I'm afraid of a lot of things, and I don't know how to share those things. I'm still learning how to share things that mean a lot to me. I mean, I can share what you want to share. I can share topical things, but I just still have a hard time getting inside of myself. And as much as I am a chatterbox, I know that, you know, you probably think if you tell me something, it's not gonna be all over Lubbock tomorrow, but that's not true. I'm very good. If you tell me not to tell, I won't, because I know it'll hurt. Because it's happened to me before. It's happened to whoops, everybody in this room. You tell somebody something very, you know, that could shatter you, and then you meet, meet it at the door when you go to work the next day, or somebody comes over. And, you know, I don't do that. And, um, but the disadvantages is that I don't share myself. Well, I do now to some people. And, um, the, I don't know how to say this, but this, this is the part that's been a blessing to me because I know, like I said, if someone's depressed, I won't go up and say, are you depressed? But, and part of this was coming back from, La Mesa after Todd, no, <laughs> but, but, and working at Tech, and all of these children, babies at Tech, it was amazing to me how many of them were so sad, and I, you know, I would see it, and against policy, I would ask them, do you have a church, <laughs> or, you know, I would share, you know, are you okay? And a lot of them would talk to me. And uh, nine times out of ten, it was because they were majoring in something their dad or mom wanted them to major in. And I said, well, what would you major in if you were doing it? And they'd tell me. And I said, well, why don't you do that? You know, you might found, find more uh, peace with yourself. And then your mom, dad, are still going to love you. They're just trying to. And I don't remember one kid. I I remember him looking straight at me and said, but this one makes more, I was in uh, water engineering, and he said, but this one makes more money. And I said, so money's going to make you happy. That's the answer. And he, he looked at me a long time, and he said, well, I said, now your daddy's going to be happy, and you're going to have money. Whoa, you know. And I've always wondered what happened to him. And he's probably happy. I hope so. But anyway, um, and back to the doctors and medication. I'm a strong believer in medication. Now, not everybody is, and I, I even believe in holistic ways to help yourself. You know, it doesn't have to be by RX or something like that. But Hippie Doc and I found, finally found the right medicine. And it was uh, within a, a month or two, I started to heal, and I healed in a different person. I was still the same person, and I was beginning to find that person I was before I got depressed, but I was also a new person because I saw so much during that dark period that I knew I needed to fix about myself and the world. <laughs> Here I am again trying to fix the world. But, you know, I, f I found out a lot about myself that really wasn't good and I had to work on myself back to the horoscope why, you know, I'm a Gemini. And if you've ever done these temperament tests, you know, the sanguine and all that stuff, you're supposed to be uh, like 60-40 on the, the different types of personalities. Well, I turned out 90% sanguine, which is so bad because I took on every stinking one of the bad things, too. And they are not good. <laughs> and I was doing that. And so I tried to tone that part down. And I found out that I was, you know, hard to admit, but I was really overpowering people with this personality that they didn't know what to do with. Because, I mean, it's just like, you know, boom, here she is. <laughs> 
And, and during this time is when we, we started teaching. We joined the church, Methodist church in Muleshoe because huh, Monty ran the Baptist preach off. It wasn't me. Anyway, uh, because, <laughs> because we were dancing. We were square dancing, and he said, you shouldn't be doing that. And I was going to say something. Man, I wasn't ready. He took it over, and we became Methodist <laughs> after that. <laughs> But um, anyway, that's when we started teaching. And I, I don't do real well with little kids, but that age in high school, especially I like high school. So every place we've ever lived, we've always asked, I mean, we walk in the door, will you teach? And I thought, wow, what's wrong? Well, we moved to La Mesa, will you teach? And I walked in and your preacher and his best friend, David, were upside down against a wall with their feet up in the air. And I totally ignored them and went around the room and I went over and said, what's your name? And they told me, well, I outlasted them because they finally had to get down. Their faces were so red that they couldn't, they couldn't stand that. But that's, I knew what they were doing and I just wasn't gonna let him get away with it on the first day. So that's how I met Todd. But anyway. <laughs> And that class was really special to me because it was a group, how many were in there, 12? It was a real big class and it was real, and it was interesting because we had seventh graders mixed in with high school, which is really unusual. But these kids, you know, small town, they were so ingrained with each other that they knew each other so well. And I would ask them questions, you know, every Sunday morning I would ask them, what did you do today? And one Sunday morning, this young lady said, I went to uh, Lubbock with a friend. She was going to get an abortion, and Monty nearly <laughs> fell out of his chair. <laughs> his mouth dropped. And the first thing I said, how do you feel about that? Well, that brought up a really big conversation of how she felt about it. She thought, oh, man, it's okay. It's a thing of now. But it really bothered her, and so it convicted her about that subject. And everybody has an opinion on that, and everybody's right if it's their opinion. You know, I have mine, and, you know, but I just wanted... I just wanted to know if she knew what that was. And that's kind of how I taught Sunday school, a free thinker. I wanted you to think past the bubble. But anyway, so after blaming God for everything, I began to understand my condition was not self-inflicted. It was medically inflicted. Now, sometimes it is self-inflicted. And the doctor told me one of the things he said that was so true with depression once you have it, it will come back. But each time it comes, you can you know how to deal with it, and each time it gets better. And that has been very true. To this day, I say I suffer from depression because I do. I have uh, down times that I have to really work myself through it and talk to myself, and I still take medication for um, anxiety and panic attacks because if I didn't, <laughs> I would be all over the place. But, and, you know, that's another thing that I'm very firm on. If you need medication and you work with your doctor and you find the right one, do it. Don't let somebody else decide for you that you could be depressed or just get over it because it's not true. And another thing I've learned recently through somebody that's very dear to me is if you need therapy, do it. Because sometimes, you know, if, if I had ever had the chance, I would have had the therapist up against the wall <laughs> telling him everything that was wrong, you know. But then again, I don't know if I would or not because I find it real hard to talk about myself in that way. But there's things that are out there that God made these people for a reason. And yes, there's bad doctors and yes, there's bad therapists. But you just have to find one that works for you if you have to keep going around. And I know in today's world of, of uh, medicine and how it's all controlled by the government. It's kind of hard to, to do that, but it's still imperative if you need help. And if you have a friend that you can talk to that you know is there for you and not to sell your soul, so to speak, talk to them. And you know, it's one thing I can do. I, uh, another thing I've learned through depression is, um, Oh, this is another thing about the Holy Spirit, because that's what this is supposed to be about. Um, and I just would let me stop here and explain. I'm not sure if I understand, because Monty and I had a long talk about this, and I know I don't understand it, what the Holy Spirit actually is. 
because for me and through the depression, I realized there have been times in my life when I think it was the Holy Spirit that stopped me from doing anything, remember college. And then um, that's what I feel like the Holy Spirit has given me is to be able to, if you come to me to talk to me, I know what to say. I know what to say if I see you and think you might have depression or a problem or something, I can come up and say something, but not ever mention it. I just know. What is that? What is that? Discernment. <laughs> okay, okay, I have another gift, discernment. Okay. <laughs> but God gave that to me, and I think a lot of times it, it's the Holy Spirit. I just, I just feel things, and I know things that I shouldn't feel or know. I just know, and a lot of that is because I did go through this deep, dark hole, and I had to find my way back out, and through it all, I never, I was always so mad at God for doing this to me until I realized that I was thanking him for doing, I don't want to ever go through that again, but I was thankful for what, what had happened to me through this way, and um, let me see what else. The thing that bothers me most, I think, about depression is when I worked at Tech and I saw those babies, <laughs> and they were hurting, and it's so hard, and especially when you go to a university like Tech and you're just, you came from a small town or you came from a very sheltered family, man, you can tell because they're scared, and they don't want to say that, especially guys, but it's just, and it's hard to not, for me, not to say do you have a church that you go to? Can, can you talk to your pastor or something like that? Or do you have a youth leader or something? And like I said, that was against policy, so to speak. But it wasn't against me and how I felt. And so what? It's just a job. <laughs> Whatever. Um, let me see. I'm getting through this. I'm getting through this. You know, I look at I look back at those times and it's like a, you know, I'm watching a movie and I'm in it. I'm the star. But I don't know who she is. And I don't ever want to go back to that person, but I am thankful that she she's a part of me. <laughs> and um and I can live with that. But, um, let me see. I think that's it. And Stephanie asked me if I had a Bible verse, and I couldn't, she asked me off the top of my head, I couldn't think. But here are three that are very good for people who are going through a depression. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Psalm 34, 17, 18. Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41, 10. Whoops. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 16, excuse me, Matthew 11, 26. So to sum this up, if you need help, seek help, whether it's a doctor or friends, your parents, your mom, <laughs> or, um, and you know, this is another thing, you know, I'm as bad as my sister was, I call my kids every day because I want to hear their voice, because I can tell, moms can tell by voices, their, their spouse or their kids, grandkids. So I, I do that, I keep up with my friends every day that, you know, well, my close friends that I care about, I want to know what they're doing and how they're doing and stuff like that. And um, let me see. And basically what it, what it means is God never left me, but I didn't know that. But I knew there was something pushing me. I just didn't, I couldn't realize it at the time. And as I said, I was angry but that anger served a good purpose because 
it kept me going to really to put it bluntly it kept me going and i'm the type that if something knocks me down i get up and fix it and i couldn't <laughs> and that was just so unlike me i didn't know what to do i didn't know what to do and i didn't know what to tell people to do so finally i found hippie doc and i and god got me well and i think the holy spirit because i do think that sometimes things happen and i'm going like you know that comedian that used to go Ooh. <laughs> i think that's the holy spirit for me I don't know how it is for anybody else, but um, it works. And don't ever give up on God because he certainly hasn't given up on me yet. <laughs> That's it. Okay. <laughs> is Jenny Jo and Penny come up uh, to... Uh, uh, sing our, our closing hymn. Uh, I do want you to know the altars are open. And also, Elisa, thank you for sharing uh, that with us because, I, you know, I'm, uh, we don't talk about mental health enough. Amen. You know, and, and I, just, I just want you to know if you're joining us online or if you are, uh, are, are with us in worship today and you – you really connected with what Elisa said, and that's where you are. Uh, there are people that love you and care for you and would be super interested just to visit with you. Now, I don't know how comfortable y'all will, will feel with this, but if you feel comfortable today and, and you have, uh, the Lord has brought you through seasons of depression before, and you know what that looks like, and you know what it looks like on the other side of that, and you're willing to visit with somebody that may be struggling right now, would you be willing to raise your hand and say um, that you've been through that? I have been through that before, if anyone else. I just want you to look around. Keep your hands up, okay? Now, listen, these people, just like Elisa said, they know what you're going through, and you're not alone. Amen? Let's do that again. Raise your hands again if you've been through that. You are not alone here. And so I really want to encourage you to maybe pull one of these uh, saints uh, aside and to visit with them today don't wait today and stuff there's a great uh, word shalom that we all know and you know for the longest time I thought that that just meant peace in the midst of conflict but you know what it really means more than that it means completeness or wholeness shalom shalom is what we will hear our our, uh, our Jewish brothers and sisters say to each other and Listen, God is restoring people, amen? And when God said he renews our mind, he's not kidding about that as well. And what the children experienced this morning in the children's sermon when they get sad, to know that you're not alone and God cares about those very moments is really true. So I hope you won't, like Elisa said, I hope that you won't burden that yourself by yourself. I hope you'll take her words and her encouragement to say, that it's okay where you are and who you are and that you'll find somebody, Jesus with skin on, amen, to go and let them love on you and care for you as well. Thank you, Elisa, very much for that. Y'all stand as we sing our last hymn together and uh, come to the altar as you feel led. Please join in our last hymn, number 361, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, 1, 2, and 4. Judgment throne. 
Did you have a good time this morning? Amen. I want to invite all of you down to the Fellowship Hall to enjoy Navajo tacos and rock and dessert, okay? And I do want to also ask that you be sure to stop by the ministry board. We're going to move it down there. And so to stop by and to sign up for donated items and also to be people's prayer partners as well. But really what I want more than that is that you take this message to heart of what Elisa has shared with us today, and you go knowing that you're not strange or weird if you're feeling bluesy and down. Amen to that. You know, there are more people out there than we think. And wouldn't it be nice if they found what Elisa had found as well? So we're just going to pray for that. Lord Jesus, as we go from here, God, Father, thank you that you care about every single inch of us, Lord. Not just the successful parts, not just the happy parts, not just the excited parts, God. But, Lord, when we are down and when we are low, Father, you are there, and you love us, God. Thank you, Jesus, for Lisa's words today, Lord. Bless this food right now, as Jill said it, God. God, may you let this food go to the blessing of the nutrients in our body, Lord, and we thank you for the hands. Amen, church family. We thank you for the hands that have prepared it and for the purpose of this fundraiser today, God, Jesus. Bless this food and the people that eat. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, love y'all. See y'all.